It's on tonight. Game one between the Nashville Predators and Vancouver Canucks in their first round playoff matchup. And on this Locked On Predators episode, we're going behind enemy lines. Your Locked On Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the Locked On Predators podcast, and thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are your free daily Nashville Predators podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Want to kick off this extra postseason crossover preview episode with a shout out to our Locked On Pred heads, our everyday listeners who tune in to talk Nashville Predators hockey with us. We appreciate your support and we love that we get to spend a part of your day with you. I'm Ann Kimmel. I am a writer at Penalty Box Radio. I am usually joined by my partner in crime, Nick Morgan. But today we have a special guest I'm excited for y'all to meet. I am going to be joined by one of the co-hosts of Locked on Canucks, Trevor Beggs. I'm excited for you to meet Trevor and to hear from him about all things Vancouver Canucks ahead of tonight's game. Trevor and I are going to talk about the biggest storylines for each of these teams through the regular season. We're going to talk about players. We're going to talk about matchups that could swing this series. We're also going to share a couple of X factors. And in the end, we're going to make a bold prediction. Before we dive into all of that, though, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by Sleeper. Download the Sleeper app and use promo code LOCKEDONNHL to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. All right, I am joined right now by Trevor Beggs. Trevor is the co-host of the always fun and entertaining Locked on Canucks show. And Trevor is joining us. We're going to preview this really interesting first round series between Vancouver and Nashville. Trevor, first of all, thank you for joining us. Second of all, did you have this matchup on your hockey bingo card? Uh, I, yeah, not, not, uh, not more than a week ago. I did not, that's for sure. And, uh, certainly going back to August and September, I don't think anyone in their right mind had this on their hockey bingo card. Again, we got two teams who were widely, uh, picked to miss the playoffs. If you look at the odds heading into the season. So, uh, two of the most surprising teams in hockey meeting up in round one, who doesn't love surprises. That's what sports is all about. It's going to be it's going to be so great and what's so funny is nobody may have predicted this but I'm telling you there are so many people that can't wait to tune into this series because it's going to be really great I think. One of the things that we do here at Lockdown Predators when we do a game recap we always do one word to describe the game. I'm going to put you on the spot. I want you to describe the Canucks regular season in one word and explain to me why you use that word. Yeah, surprising is too easy, but I'm going to go with thrilling. Uh, you know what? From the get-go, uh, game one of the Canucks season where, honestly, the vibes weren't great. You know, we had a, a potential Garland trade request and some PD, uh, Elias Pettersson contract drama. And this is before yeah. game one of the regular season. So the vibes weren't great. I think Canucks fans were preparing for another season where they were going to slump out of the gates and miss the playoffs. And who knows what's going to happen next. And what happens? They thump the Edmonton Oilers 8-1 to one on home ice. And that game really set the tone for the entire season. Um, they came out of the gates hot after that. And again, they've been near the top of the standings for the entire season. And, you know, I mentioned that word thrilling. You know, this team was, you know, they got some flack for being lucky, but they were one of the highest scoring, the highest scoring team right. in the first half. And one of the most exciting teams in hockey. And I would say, you know, that thrill has subsided a bit maybe. As the season's gone on, uh, they're not scoring as much. They kind of came back down to earth with uh, the luck, but still some of the most thrilling players in the world in their roster. And, you know, people think of Elias Pettersson and Quinn Hughes, but, you know, really it's for, for me, it's Quinn Hughes and, and JT Miller were uh, up front in terms of the skaters, just thrilling players to watch all season long. Yeah. And I want to just be full disclosure, true confession. I was going back through and watching our prediction episodes for an episode we did on how right or wrong were we. And there was a, 
a clip where we were looking at the October schedule and I'm like, oh, and then you've got Vancouver. Like it was going to be a gimme game. And I look back at that now and I'm like, oh, man, was I wrong? <laughs> like, y'all, y'all beat us three times. There was nothing gimme about Vancouver when it comes to the Nashville Predators. So, yeah, it, it was surprising. And I'm I'm glad it was thrilling for you all. It was a little bit tough, Vancouver, for the Nashville Predators. Yeah. yeah, and and and, uh, to... and and how about yeah? Let, let, let's hear your one word for the Nashville Predator season. You might have said it to your listeners before, but I I'm curious how you would describe a season that was also surprising. So can't use that word. <laughs> it was it was very surprising. You know the word I'm going to use, and and you know Nashville Predators fans know this story very very well, and I'm sure Canucks fans probably do too. But the word is YouTube. Because a YouTube yes. concert changed the trajectory of this Predator season. And it was so weird the way that this unfolded, Trevor. So they lost to Dallas, horrific nine to two humiliation on home ice. And the team was getting ready to go to Vegas. And what none of us knew in the media was that they had planned this big, like, team building trip to the Sphere to see YouTube. We walked into the post-game locker room, which, you know, after a 9-2 to loss, it's never fun. But there was just a vibe, like even more than just a embarrassed we lost that bad, weird vibe. And then we went and did post-game with Andrew Brunette, and he made a comment about they're thinking about their vacations. And we were like, are we still thinking about, like, all-star break vacations? Like, what is this? Well, then the story broke and Barry Trotz and Andrew Burnett put the kibosh on you two. And it has just been a whole different season ever since. So when I think of this year, I just automatically think of you two. And, you know, Predators fans have joked and said, if by some chance the Predators won the Stanley Cup, we would invite Bono and you two to perform on Broadway for them because they did not get to see them. So it was crazy. Yeah, and that story, I even mentioned it doing a little preview right up about the series as well. And it is a unique story for sure, the fact that that story broke and, you know, they go on the run that they did after you too. And, uh, you know, and maybe you can enlighten some of the Canucks listeners as well. Obviously, everything changed for Nashville after they canceled that concert. But what were some of the main catalysts of their success uh, when they went on that run? Such a great question. The Predators, obviously, this is a very different season. New head coach who brought in a, a very different system than anything Nashville had played under their two previous head coaches. A lot of turnover on the roster. The Preds uh, traded Ryan Johansson. They bought out Matt Duchesne and Barry Trotz brought in some veterans. So there was so much change going on at the beginning of the season. And Andrew Brunette would say they're just not getting it. Like the Predators team just didn't get it. And I think that was a come to Jesus moment for the Nashville Predators in the sense that like, and not that they were, you know, not taking it seriously, but it was like a, hey, we've really got to focus. And it took some time, but I think what really happened in that 18 point streak for the Predators, that 18 game point streak was that it clicked. Like finally the system that Brunette was trying to get going clicked. And then some of the players got back to what we were used to seeing from them. It was a rough start in Nashville. It was a rough start in Nashville, but I do think it was just time and repetition and repetition. It does. It's not very glamorous, but I really think that was kind of the key for them. Yeah. And uh, again, I've watched this Predators team a little bit down the stretch here, and they do look like a much different team from uh, what the Canucks saw earlier in the season when they beat them in three straight games, right? Where Nashville looked very mid. Uh, that's what I, the word I would have used to describe them in the first half of the year was mid. And, oh, yeah. you know, the, the one thing I've been saying on, on Locked On Canucks is, you know, don't discount this Predators team. I think there's not just the Canucks, but I think a lot of Western Conference contenders are looking at Nashville and saying like, oh, Look at the surprise team that made the playoffs. But uh, I, I'm sure your fans, uh, Predators fans know this, but you guys got some great players in place. And uh, sure, I, I don't know if there's Stanley Cup aspirations in that market. Tell me if I'm wrong. But there's certainly the pieces there to really be a, a thorn in the side for the Canucks and other teams if they end up going on a run. Yeah, I don't know that anybody here in Nashville, everybody wants the Stanley Cup. Everybody, because 2017 felt a little bit like this, the 2017 Predators team, they were 16th in to get into mm. the playoff. They were playing the President's Trophy winning Chicago Blackhawks. Nobody thought they had a chance. So I think there's like a romantic notion around Nashville about what the playoffs can look like when you sneak in. So we're 
Let's see if that can repeat itself twice. I don't know. But you're somebody who you've been up close, personal in, in the world of the Vancouver Canucks. Were you surprised by their season? Like what, how did you predict their season to go? You. Yeah. So I, I did say this uh, throughout the summer leading up to the season that I believe the Canucks were a playoff team. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought they would be a wild card team. I, I really did think that the top three in the Pacific was pretty set between Edmonton, Vegas, and LA. I thought the Canucks could maybe be in that same tier as LA, but I thought Edmonton and Vegas were clear cut the two best teams in the division. So uh, happy to eat uh, or happy to be wrong on that one. That's for sure. Uh, but I just think so many things went right for the Canucks this season, right? Uh, you look at Demko, Vesna finalist, mm -hmm. Quinn Hughes, you know, reaching the height, uh, the height of his powers, putting up some Roman Yosi like numbers, if you will, uh, and performing like, you know, one of the best defensemen uh, in the world. Uh, and then up front, you know, uh, Elias Pedersen had a slower second half, but he still finishes top 20 in scoring. JT Miller, his uh, transformation to being, you know, when he came to Vancouver five years ago, he was a second line left winger. Now he's a first line 100 point shutdown bona fide center it's 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 his yeah. transformation is amazing and yeah brock besser hitting 40 goals phil proning meshing with Hughes, the depth performing everything went right for this this season for vancouver and jim rutherford had a semi-famous quote in this market before the season started that he said quote if everything goes right we're a playoff team well everything did go right and because of that they were one of the best teams in the nhl this season I think Vancouver shocked everybody, but you're right. When you look at what's on this roster and you look at the talent that's there, the experience that's there, you guys have an interesting core. It's young, but it doesn't play young. It's got just enough experience mixed with youth to be really successful on paper. This Canucks team is scary, especially at the end of the regular season. When we look at the stats of some of these players you're talking about, I mean, it is a whole thing. Coming up, we're going to name names, okay? We've talked big picture, but we're going to name some names at positions. We're going to talk defensemen. We're going to talk forwards. We're going to talk goaltending together about this postseason first round matchup. Before we dive into all of that, though, do want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by our great friends at eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience, friends, that's the formula for winning championships. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with with eBay's guaranteed fit, your parts guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusion supply. eBay guaranteed fit. Only available to U.S. customers. All right, we are here with Trevor Beggs, co-host of Locked on Connects, previewing what's going to be a really fun, interesting, we'll see how it goes, first round series. Let's talk about some of the players who maybe mirror each other in some ways on these two rosters. Let's talk defensemen. Two defensemen that are getting a ton of attention across the league as well they should. Roman Yossi and the incredible Quinn Hughes. I have said on Locked On Predators, and I stand by this, if the Hughes had a dog, I would want the Predators to draft it. Because these Hughes, I don't know what's in that genetic pool, but wow. We're looking at two players who I think are in Norris conversation. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say I think Quinn Hughes is going to win it. Um, that's not my personal preference, but I really do think Quinn Hughes has, has done everything he needs to do. So what do you see in Quinn Hughes's game and what could maybe in the playoffs, what, are, what should we expect to see from him? And is there anything that you think may throw him off his game? Well, I think the one thing that could potentially throw him off his game, I don't think this is necessarily going to be the case, but it's, it's being physical and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously teams across the nhl have tried to do it and this guy is as slippery as they come right uh, and it's hard to get a body on quinn hughes and 
you talk about what makes him so great and, and it's his it's his, his escapism his edge work his ability to skate with and without the puck i mean there's stats out there uh, i think among defensemen this season he's held on to the puck for what a half an hour 45 minutes more than any other defenseman in the nhl i mean the puck is always on quinn hughes's stick and you'll you'll see this as well in this series you know quinn hughes when he has the puck in the offensive zone, he's skating down the blue line. He's setting up guys in front of the net. And if he gets caught in a position, he's almost always making it back in time. I mean, uh, you know, might not be the biggest guy in the world, but might have the biggest lungs in the NHL. I mean, this guy could skate for days. And, uh, you know, Roman Yossi, I, I look at him as a just a, such a polished stud defenseman. I, there's no flaws in his game. But when I look at Quinn Hughes, there's just a, an inch more of dyna- dynamicism in his game uh, compared to Roman Yossi. I mean, we're grasping at straws. For my money, and I'm going to disrespect Kale McCarr, the two best defensemen in the NHL this season. And I think, uh, again, I don't, I don't know your personal preferences in that Quinn Hughes will win the Norris, but I'd be shocked if he didn't win the Norris. I would be absolutely shocked. I would put money on Quinn Hughes winning the Norris. And you know what? I would say most Nashville Predators fans would not squawk about that if it went to Kale McCarr squawking everywhere. I'm just, just telling you how it would be in Nashville. <laughs> When it comes to Roman Yossi, he, it's so funny you talk about, you know, Quinn Hughes. And, and I see what you're talking about, about kind of that dynamic player. Like he, he's got that extra quick thing in his game. Uh, Roman Yossi wasn't this team's highest scorer this year, but he was uh, tied his career high in goals. He had his second best year in points, 85 points. What's interesting is Yossi did not start out the season as well as he finished the season. And, you know, I always say in hockey, like in relationships, timing is everything. And it's really good that Yossi's game is where it's at right now, because that's where it's going to need to be in this playoff round, especially against the offensive weapons that the Canucks have. Definitely playing some of the best hockey of his career. Um, We'll see what he can do. Really, you know, been good at the end of the season. He was so key in that 18-game consecutive point streak. I mean, he really was key. I think he had like 26 points in 18 games, 24 points in 18 games. So it's going to be really interesting, and I think it's going to be interesting for everybody across the NHL to watch these two defensemen play each other. Let's talk about the other side of the puck. Let's talk about JT Miller, 103 point JT Miller, bless, and Philip Forsberg. I think these are two offensive dynamos that are going to go at it. Talk to me about JT Miller and his game. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't help myself uh, for mentioning him in the first segment. But uh, again, we mentioned this on our show. He might be the most surprising 100 point player in the NHL over the past 30 years. And obviously, a lot of guys hit that mark in the 80s when scoring was through the roof, but that's not really disrespect to JT Miller, just that it's it's really hard to get 100 points in the NHL. Yeah. And again, like the fact that not only is he you know putting up 100 plus points, but he goes up against the opposition's best line on a night-to-night basis. So you mentioned JT Miller and Philip Forsberg, especially at Rogers Arena, expect those two to be going head-to-head. I think it's going to be the JT Miller line versus the Ryan O'Reilly line because JT Miller has gone up against the opposition's best players all season long. And he still managed to hit 100 points while doing that. So, yeah. uh, again, I, I think JT Miller, <laughs> we talk about players who are underrated. Um, JT Miller, I think, might be underrated on the NHL. Uh, not so much in yeah. Vancouver anymore. Uh, I think Gustav Nyquist might be a guy who's underrated on the NHL based on what he did this season as well. Um, but it's funny because I look at JT Miller and you mentioned Philip Forsberg. I think a Ryan O'Reilly a little bit. JT Miller might be a, a bit of a younger version of Ryan O'Reilly. Like they they play similar games, but JT Miller certainly has an extra um, ounce of offensive creativity in this game compared to Ryan O'Reilly as well. So again, I think those two are two of the most well-rounded centers in hockey, and it'll be really interesting to see them go head to head. And again, when you talk about goal scorers, you'll know, Philip Forsberg forty-eight goals. JT Miller is likely to play with Brock Besser at forty goals. So if yeah. those two lines go head to head, that's going to be some much watch hockey when they're on the ice as well. I want to ask you what has led to this development in JT Miller's game since he's been in Vancouver. Like, what has changed? What did this? You know, it's it's a great question, and it it kind of happened as soon as he joined the Canucks. To be honest, mm-hmm. um, you know, he's gone through three head coaches now since he's been here. Uh, but in his first season in Vancouver back in 2018-19, way, way back uh, in those pre-COVID days, he had 72 points in 69 games. So uh, at that time, it was by far his most productive NHL season. He carried that into the bubble playoffs. He was a point-per-game player as well. 
Um, and in that season uh, in Vancouver, w w what we call is the lotto line was born. It was JT Miller, Elias Pedersen, and Brock Bastard. So that's kind of an ace up in Rick Tockett's sleeve. He hasn't used it that much. When he has used it, they've been incredibly productive in, in uh, right. small minutes, but it does kind of wreck the balance of the Canucks lineup. Um, but again, it's, I think it's over time, he's played more center. He's really struggled there defensively as a center for a while. Even last season wasn't, uh, wasn't really strong defensively. Uh, by the eye test or by the metrics. And I think something clicked under Rick Tockett where his defensive game has just come miles and it's caught up to his offensive game. And, and again, I think it makes him one of the most well-rounded centers in the NHL. I think it's going to be interesting. We talked about Hughes and Yossi in the Norris Trophy. I think the Jack Adams is going to be interesting. Rick Tockett obviously done a tremendous job. People are starting to talk about Andrew Brunette. He took kind of a ragtag group of you know, veterans, young players, and, and got them into the playoffs. It's going to be interesting to see how those two coaches, the conversation continues to go about how they have done as well. You mentioned Ryan O'Reilly. You mentioned Gustav Nyquist. These two guys came in and I think shocked the socks off of a lot of people, including people in Nashville who, when Barry Trot signed them, said, say what? Say what? Uh, were, are we really are we really doing that? They have been worth every penny Barry Trotz paid for them. But really, the offensive guy for Nashville has been Philip Forsberg. He set the franchise record for goals at 48. He beat Matt Duchesne's goal, uh, his franchise record. Playing on that top line, though, with Ryan O'Reilly and Gustav Nyquist. And that combination really has been, been magic. They work really, really well together. They get along fantastically off the ice. Um, my, one of my favorite quotes from the whole season, Ryan O'Reilly referred to Nyquist and Forsberg as his Swedish meatballs my Swedish meatballs. And then one time he said something to me about, I've got to learn Swedish because I don't know if they're talking about me. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're not. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're not. But they've been really good together. Philip Forsberg kind of going into the playoffs again, timings, everything, you know, he's got great puck handling. He's got a very deceptive release on his shot, accurate shot. He also has been really sneaky when it comes to takeaways. He's third in the league in takeaway uh, third. No, he's not. He's sixth in the league in takeaways, but he's just been really sneaky on both sides of the puck. And just a little bit of trivia, keep your eye on Philip Forsberg. He could be bringing that new dad energy. His wife is expecting if she goes early, it could happen during this series. And you know those new dads in hockey, they light it up. So it's just something to keep keep your eye on. One of the biggest head-to-head -head matchups that I think is going to be interesting, and it's one that I think could make or break this series, is goaltending. Talk to me about Thatcher Demko. Oh, man. I've, I mean, I've been the biggest Demko believer since he was drafted in 2014, you know, based on his, his resume, his style, his progression. And I, I'm not surprised that, you know, and for my opinion, he was the second best goalie in the NHL this season behind Connor Hellebuck. Uh, now, he he cooled a little bit after a really hot torrid start. But um, again, he's just been so consistent throughout the year. And it helps now that in Vancouver, he's playing behind a team that knows how to play defense. Because I think for most yeah. of, well, not most, pretty much all of his NHL career, he was playing behind a team that was one of the worst defensive teams in hockey. Uh, by some metrics, the worst defensive team in hockey. And that has changed under Rick Tockett. It's made his life easier. Um, obviously, the the one big uh, thing about Thatcher Demko to think of is that he's been injured for six weeks and came back yeah. and played the last two games before the playoffs have started here. So, um, you know, uh, you, you, and you can comment a bit on Soros. I look at these two goaltenders and you have Demko, who's only only played two games since missing about, you know, six weeks worth of injury. You have Soros, who played the most games in the NHL this season, the most games in the NHL over the past three years. I do wonder if rust or fatigue might be a factor for either of these guys. I think that's going to be interesting. And you talked about the injury to Demko, you know, come back for two games. What, you know, we're kind of all wondering, like, is he back at, at top form? Where Was Vancouver able to rest him long enough? When it comes to Saros, the thing I will say about Saros is Saros is best with consistency, which really sucks when you've got a backup like Kevin Lincoln and who's been really, really good for the Nashville Predators. But Saros actually does better with more games. So I don't think that anybody's necessarily concerned about fatigue. They are concerned, though, about just overall the season that Saros has had. They're going to need what we call vintage Saros in this series because this was statistically his worst season. 
started off kind of cool, but we always say Saros is a crock pot. He's not a microwave. He takes time to warm up, but he just sort of didn't hit his stride when the Predators were used to seeing it. So how Saros does in, in this series is going to be really interesting. I think this goaltending matchup, I think it's going to be a, a, a big part of what happens on the ice is what's going to happen with these goaltenders. Coming up, we are going to put our money where our mouths are. We're going to make some predictions. We're also going to talk about some X factors. Who are a couple of players that maybe we haven't talked about that we should be talking about? We're going to cover that in just a minute. First, want to let you know this episode is brought to you by Sleeper. It is playoffs, my friends, and not just NHL players are focused on what happens on the ice. When these two teams kick off the first round series, you too can play along with daily fantasy hockey on Sleeper. You can win big by playing daily fantasy hockey on Sleeper. It is the official daily fantasy app of the Locked On NHL Network. Sleeper is our number one choice for daily fantasy sports and especially daily fantasy hockey because with Sleeper, you can win 100 times your cash in daily fantasy hockey contests. All you have to do is pick whether players like J.T. Miller, Roman Yossi, Quinn Hughes, or Philip Forsberg will record more or less than those sleeper projections for things like goals, assists, saves, plus, minus, and more in any given game. To win that 100 times bet, all you have to do is correctly predict the outcome of eight player stats. That's right, friends. You could win 100 times your money playing daily fantasy hockey. So start paying attention and nail your picks so you can win big. Use promo code locked on NHL and you're going to get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. That's code locked on NHL. See sleepers terms of use for details and locational availability. All right, we are wrapping up this preview episode. We're going to talk about some X Factor players. So I want you to start, Trevor. Give me the name of a player that maybe we haven't talked about that could be an X Factor for Vancouver in this series. All right, I'm going to cheat on this one and give you two because I Perfect. think there's one who we absolutely have not talked about, and I think there's a player for the Canucks who's absolutely the X Factor. And it feels weird to call this guy an X Factor, but I'm going with Elias Pettersson. Uh, okay. Canucks fans know this, but Elias Pettersson has not looked like himself for probably about two months now. And again, you look at the stats and you don't think that's the case. He had uh, 90 points or almost 90 points this season, but he's just looked off um, for about two months now. Uh, There's some reports that he was dealing with a groin injury, but in the Canucks last game where they rested some guys, he was out there playing. So I think it's more so a confidence issue at this point. Um, but Elias Pettersson, we, you know, I think fans on the NHL know he's one of the most talented players in the NHL. If Elias Pettersson can get back to being the Elias Pettersson that most hockey fans know, uh, this series could be over quicker than people think. Now, I'm not predicting that's going to be the case. I think it's going to be a tough series. Uh, but if Elias Pettersson finds that gear and all of a sudden you got Elias Pettersson and JT Miller down the middle, that's something I think the Predators are going to have problems with. Uh, another player we haven't mentioned is, is Elias Lindholm. Um, mm, and Elias yeah. Lindholm, uh, he's also struggled since joining the Canucks. He battled an injury. He had a wrist injury for a little bit. Um, he's looked good over the past couple games on uh, the, a third line with um, Connor Garland and Dakota Joshua. And it kind of leads me to the point. I kind of want to ask you about, again, some of the X Factors depth guys on Nashville that are on my mind. I'm kind of curious uh, of the X Factors there. But for uh, uh, Elias Lindholm, this is a guy who scored 40 goals in the NHL. In Vancouver, defensively, he's been great. He's been great on the peak. He's been great on faceoffs, but he's had next to no offensive productivity, which isn't like him. So uh, I'm going with Elias Pettersson and Elias Lindholm. If those two guys play up to their potential and the Canucks are rolling Pettersson, Lindholm, and Miller down the middle, those three guys might be better than any center on the Predators roster. No offense, Ryan yeah. Riley. Yeah. There you go. When it comes to X factors for Nashville, first of all, I want to say Nashville knows how good Elias Pettersson can be because he absolutely ran up and down the street all over us in the three games. So we're well aware. We we we've been warned. When it comes to X factors for Nashville, there's there's a couple. I want to give you a line. Um, 
And then I'm going to give you a player. And it may be nobody that you expect. Of course, we talk about Nyquist, Forsberg, O'Reilly, all that stuff. But offensively, let me tell you the name of a young, spunky fella named Luca Evangelista. Also, we call him Pretty Boy Vincenzo here. And Luca Evangelista, 22-year-old kid, this is his first full season in the NHL. And he has had kind of an up and down trajectory this season, but he has found his game. And he just naturally sort of walks around life with a lot of confidence, a lot of mind. And when that translates on the ice and when he is aggressive in puck battles and gets the puck, he can really create some amazing things with it. So keep your eye on Luke Evangelista. He's going to be the one with the really great hair if they take their helmets off. The other thing I want to talk about is our fourth line, which is not something that people normally talk about when you talk about X factors. But the fourth line, it's Michael McCarron, Kiefer Sherwood, and Cole Smith. Those are three players that people often think of as, oh, look, it's perennial AHLers who got a little bit of an opportunity. The, these three have come together in their, the sum of them is so much better than just their individual parts. And they really have become an identity line for the Predators. They're the ones that their goal is, we're going to go out there, we're going to harass, we're going to get the puck, and we're going to get a shot on goal, or we're going to get an offensive zone face-off. And they can really be a difference maker, energy-wise, and also just in being annoying AF to other teams. So I'm, I'm just saying, you know, of course, O'Reilly, Forsberg, Yossi, Nyquist, those are the big ones, but those are two little X factors that might be worth keeping your eye on. So let's talk stats. Give me a stat that makes you feel pretty confident when it comes to Vancouver in this series. Ooh, uh, that's a great question. Um, you put me on the spot a bit, but for me, it's it's their defensive numbers. And I look at their expected goals. I don't have it in front of me, but I know they have one of the lowest expected goals in the NHL. Um, yeah. And, you know, when I was doing my research prior to this series, one of the things that stood out was um, the Canucks are a lower event team than Nashville, a lower expected goals and lower mm -hmm. actual goals, or a lower expected goals for and against. And Nashville is higher expected goals and higher expected goals against. So I do wonder, you know, in playoff time, when the margins are smaller, uh, for me, it's a it's a big question. And it's a storyline. Is Andrew Burnett's style going to translate to the playoffs? Because it didn't really translate in Florida uh, with the more offensively potent team. And right. you know, I look at this Nashville Predators, and you know, I think they're what third in the league in expected goals and scoring chances, but um, you know, more of middle of the pack and in, in actual goals, especially at even strength. So uh, I do wonder if that's going to translate. And um, again, come playoff time, I kind of like uh, the defensive style, the surprising defensive style that Rick Talk and the Canucks are, are able to play in. Uh, throughout the season, they've done such a good job of limiting chances against. So I'm curious how that matches up against the Nashville Predators team. That seems to go quantity over quality. Yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be interesting. And I love that, too, when you look at those two stats and you put it in a playoff format. I think when, Like you said, I love what you said, when the margin of error is so much smaller. Let's see how that all is actually going to sift out onto the ice. When it comes to Nashville, I'm actually going to look back at you know, these three games that our two teams played already this season and the three games that Nashville played against Vancouver, where you all absolutely smoked us. Let's just be real. Uh, Forsberg, O'Reilly and Nyquist combined in those three games had a total of three points. Goalie save percentage, 838 in those three games. But Philip Forsberg finished the season with a franchise record in goals. Nyquist with a career high in points and assists. Ryan O'Reilly had one of his best performances since his Cup Selkie season. And Roman Yossi tied his career high in goals in the Norris conversation. Goaltending has been solid. This is not the same Nashville team that y'all saw at the beginning of the season. So I think that is going to be a little bit of a surprise for a lot of Canucks fans. You know, this may not be the team that you're used to seeing. So all of that aside, we've talked names, we've talked players, we've talked comparison. Let's talk what really matters. Let's talk about it. Who's going to win this series in how many games? What's your prediction? All right. Well, I, I can't do a different prediction of what I said earlier on Locked On Canucks. I'm going Canucks in six. Um, uh, again, I don't. I think it's going to be harder than, like you said, and a lot of Canucks fans think. Uh, I do think we had a lot of smart fans at this market who realized the Predators you know, have a good hockey team and got some, you know, they got more experience um, at uh, on their playoff roster. Uh, you know, when I broke it down earlier, it's 
You know, I think the Canucks have advantages at forward on defense mm-hmm. in net small margins, but I think they have advantages at all three positions and on the penalty kill as well. I think uh, that's another advantage or I think the Predators have an advantage. It's surprisingly on the power play. The Canucks power play has struggled, especially in the second half of the season. And again, that playoff experience, but you know, the Canucks play to their potential. And as I mentioned, if, if Pedersen and Lindholm are closer to the players that most people think they are, rather than the guys that were kind of struggling in the second half, then I feel pretty confident the Canucks are going to walk away with this in six games. It was interesting when this came down to, is it Vancouver or Dallas? Across the board, Predators fans would tell you, we want Vancouver. Yeah. We want Vancouver. <laughs> so I think it's going to be really interesting. I have a head prediction and a heart prediction. Head prediction, mm-hmm. I think this is going to be a six or seven game series. I, I'm just saying I've heard some Canucks fans say sweep in three. That's not happening. <laughs> but I think this is going to be a six or seven game series. I will say my head answer is that the Canucks just maybe have a little bit more depth uh, and reliability at depth that Vancouver will take it. But I will say this. I will not be surprised if the Predators can take this series in seven. If it goes to seven, the Predators are going to be hungry. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting. Again, a series nobody predicted. A series I think a lot of people are excited about. I know you all are at Lock Dog Canucks. Tell our listeners where they can find you and find the podcast. You just got to look for Locked On Canucks on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, just like uh, what Ann's doing over here. It's your team every day. Uh, and uh, thankfully, I got uh, my partner, Kyle Bowen, who uh, he's doing 80% of the work in terms of getting the show out and doing the bonus episodes. So uh, lots of stuff. Uh, uh, but yeah, Locked On Canucks, wherever you listen to podcasts. Awesome. And same thing here, Locked On Preds, wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. Trevor, always the delight. And thrilled that you came on to chat with us. Maybe we need to schedule an episode and do a breakdown after this series. But until then, good luck. Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'll say good luck, but have fun. You know, again, right, it's going to be a fun go. series. It's going to be a it fun is. series. You know, one, one thing we didn't mention that I've mentioned on the show before is Vancouver's fourth in the league in hits, Nashville fifth in the league in hits. I think it's going to be a physical series. I think it's going to be a series with not a lot of goals based on who we have in net. Uh, yeah. So I think it's just going to be uh, a bit of a, a meat grinder series, but an entertaining one of that. So should be a fun one. Anne. And uh, yeah, ha- happy to, uh, to, to rekindle and, uh, and, and connect after the series is said and done. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Trevor.